Good evening, everybody. Hi. Thank you. So obviously you guys are here to learn hopefully a little bit about design. What I want to do or hopefully accomplish is make this as interactive as possible so that any questions or comments you guys have at any time, you know, raise your hand. I was about to say shout it out, but that might not be so good. So raise your hand and I'll be kind of posing a lot of questions back to you guys and getting some feedback on some of the items, starting with UI UX for WordPress. I love this title, um, and I, don't get me wrong, I do know how to explain it, that's why you guys are here, but when it comes to like trying to explain this to my mother or father-in-law, they still say I do IT. That's how, they that's how they describe me to other people, and it's so far from the truth, I wanted to find one of those memes that you, it's like what my parents think I do, what I think I do. I found so many funny ones I couldn't choose, so I just said no. But uh, I wanted to pose a question to you guys. How would you explain it? So, raise a hand. How would you explain what UI UX is? Anybody? Getting people to do what you want them to do in a two-dimensional space. I was pretty close to mind control. <laughs> so get it, do it. Yes, in the back. I explain it to family members more like Legos. You get a set with a whole bunch of pieces and you turn it into something amazing. Well, we get a whole bunch of pieces of things that we have to then put together and turn into something amazing. You just do it all online. Yeah, that's awesome. That was actually one of the main memes that I saw. Was like, we are all master builders. Yes. yes. Lego movie, there you go. Did I see another hand somewhere over here? No? Okay. Oh yes, please. I'll just go from my own experience, how you present data in the most controllable way. Yeah, that's good. Should we forget it too? Okay. So those, those are really good. Um, so right before we get into that, I wanted to give you a little bit about me. I know the text is small. wasn't sure about the scalability, so I'll be reading this. Um, okay, so um, I've lived in Sacramento here for my entire life. I'll, you know, with the exception of going to college outside the state for a little bit. I was a missionary in Mexico for a few years, um, but most of my life has been here. Um, I am a husband and a father. I would definitely consider myself to be a geek, and I am a designer, which is what I absolutely love to do. Uh, as a designer, I've been designing for just over 12 years. I originally started with one of the largest uh, design or marketing agencies out of Utah called Wallaber Media. Um, when I worked for them, I had the opportunity to work with very large companies. Uh, kind of hard to read, but I worked for, I did work for Disney, Ikea, Acorns, Casper, the Ritz-Carlton, uh, Zupa, a lot of big entities, which gave me, you know, with those a, a wider, larger scope, a lot of more wiggle room to play around with, a lot more dollars. Um, but, it wasn't just then that I got to design for, it was all the way down to small mom and pop shops. And in my mind, the only difference <coughs> is the amount of money, but anyone, whether you're a small mom and pop, show of hands here, anyone here run their own business that's here to kind of represent themselves. Yeah, so we got quite a few. So whether you're mom and pop or you're Disney who's slowly taking over the universe, um, th there's, there's room for everyone and everyone can accomplish these things. Welcome. Do we have any chairs? You can grab this chair right here. Do we have any other chairs back there? And this is probably my favorite, if not at least one of my top favorites quotes. And it's, the alternative to good design is always bad design. There is no such thing as no design. Because when, when I talk about what I do to prospective clients or just other people in general or talks like this, I like to emphasize that um, everything, every little thing, I was actually commenting to Clayton right before we started this, that if I looked like I was walking around aimlessly, I was not. I was uh, looking at all the different intricacies of like the pipe work and the paintings and the different textures in this building because I've never been here before. And those are the types, that's one source how I source some of my inspiration. Um, and WordPress for me is is the beginning of pretty much everything that I do. Uh, why I choose to, to design with WordPress is because it's such a versatile and ever-growing platform. You know, being one of the 
being the largest platform for a CMS, uh, you can create lots of scalable websites without a lot of the limitations of other platforms. So since we saw a lot of first timers, does, ev does everyone here know the three core WordPress core, what WordPress themes are and what WordPress plugins are? I get a lot of nods. If you're not nodding, it's okay. Um, we're just going to touch base a little bit and how they pertain to the UI and UX. So what we're going to go through is, obviously we're going to do a little bit more in the intro, but we're going to talk about a few key phases. And one of my coworkers is here, and what we do at our company uh, is we've created this process and how we build a site from start to finish. And so we're going to talk about those phases, starting with the research phase, then content, then design, build, launch, and then general resources, and how that all plays to UI and UX. And keep in mind, I know if anyone wants to take any notes, you can talk to me after, I can get your email, or I can give you my card, and I will give you the slides after. So if you don't want to worry about that, um, and plus if you have any questions post this event, then you can contact me. So as an intro to the phases, um, I saw some hands when I asked about individuals. Is there anyone here that's part of a larger marketing team? Larger, not meaning hundreds. Yes, I know you, John. I work with you. <laughs> <laughs> saw one hand back right there. Awesome. So we got a few. Uh, so the phases, as I'm going to explain them, uh, can pertain to whether you're an individual or a team or even in the concept of what is called GDD. But as an individual, uh, in that scenario, this will kind of make you into a jack of all trades. Um, hopefully master of quite a few of them. But a as a team, this is really where it comes into play with having everybody in the respective roles and being able to take on the individual responsibilities to push those phases forward. Does anybody know or have heard of the term GDD? Not you, John. <coughs> Keep raising your hand. Anyone? So I'm going to... So it stands for growth driven design. Anyone now? Still no, okay. This is good. So growth driven design, we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth, but this is where the phases really become, you know, a well oiled machine, a, a nice working engine, because it's geared towards faster iterations of websites with quicker launches. So instead of as websites are today, or a lot of what we would call a static website is, you know, you, you work with either yourself or the client and you work for X amount of time, it could be one month, six months, a year, and you build that site, well then what? GDD or growth driven design is an answer to a shorter time frame where you can do, it's about 60 to 90 days, I believe. And it's working at really figuring out what are the key features you need in a website to get it launched by X date and then building the other features after the fact and iterations and improving upon it. So that starts with the research phase. So my first question to you guys is, what do you think of when you think of the research phase? What would you do there? In the back. Check out the competition. Check out the competition. So that's usually the first answer. You got an element. Uh, the users for the site, possible users. Possible users for the site, OK. Uh, yes? Purpose of the site. Say that again? Purpose of the site. Purpose of the site. Goals, yes? A, B test. A, B test, OK. Requirements. Requirements. That's good. Plus, like blueprinting requirements. Blueprinting. Personas. Personas. Yeah. Any others? Who here does all of that? Because that's a question, right? Because I remember when I first started, um, I remember thinking about all of this being great and then not really accomplishing any of it. And it was just really hard to make sure I get all these things until we actually finally created this process where it's definitive and here's the time frame that it takes. So this is the time to do pretty much all the legwork, lay the foundation. So any and all design that comes from any and all design work that you do after the research phase should be based on this content and things like, um, well, if you don't do it, you're essentially taking a stab in the dark. Because there's no, no point in just building a website to build a website if there's no clear goals, clear buyer personas, which we'll talk about, no clear strategy, no clear you know, features or 
um, requirements, what the client wants or what you want if you're working for yourself. Um, it's a time to ask questions. So who, so we, I know that we had about half, maybe a little bit less that are doing it for themselves. Um, other people working for other companies or have prospective clients or clients currently. Um, asking the right questions to those people or to yourself is important. Gathering resources, looking for inspiration, coming up with um, a sound strategy, uh, knowing that obviously no website is perfect. Yes, in the back. Do you have any examples of the right questions to ask? Yes, we will get into that. <coughs> um, so another quote that I like, the goal of a designer is to listen, observe, understand, sympathize, empathize, empathize synthesize and gain insights that enable him or her to make the invisible visible. That's a lot. I don't think my boss realizes how much I do. <laughs> like, I just had a, a, a meeting where we were presenting some brand elements to a client today, and we were talking them through it and presenting this is why, these are decisions based off of your goals and your strategy and blah, blah, blah. When I was putting this quote in previously, I was just thinking like, Wow, I do all of like I try to do all of that. I wouldn't say that I am 100% 100% of the time, but I do my best. So questions. So you had asked, you know, what are some of those questions? The best way is to, like the quote says, look at usual things with unusual eyes. So asking the right questions is pivotal to getting the right answers. Asking for things such as, what's your company mission? Any core values? Do you have any existing brand equity? What would that be? Your trademarks, copyright material that you already own that you don't want to lose that you've been building. Okay, so that's definitely part of it. A lot of like small mom posit definitely don't have the trademarks or copyright or anything. It's what, how are they known to date? And do they have any sort of social presence? And would you changing any part of that affect the users? and the people, the end users, the people that are actually using their product. So making those conscious decisions. Um, so outside of core values, ask things, one of my favorite questions is asking, what do they like and what do they not like? And I, a lot of times I like to emphasize the not like uh, over the like, but that's either websites or just things they've seen online or in other forms that they say, yes, I like this, and then we really dive into the why and break it down. I don't just say, give me a list of websites that you like, and we'll design one like that, or give me websites you don't like. Yes? So what about if um, all this is starting out as well as they want to redesign their logo, or at least you know, they are thinking that they want everything to be just totally overhauled, and is this something that you're going to want to spend much time on? Well, I mean, in the beginning, I guess you need that brand. Is that something that uh, is going to be a part of the research? Definitely. So asking the questions about their brand equity and brand assets. So do you have a logo? Do you have a color palette? Do you have specific colors you use currently? Do you have specific type family that you use? What, you know, what fonts do you... Uh, and if the answer is yes, our immediate follow-up question is, can we have those? Like, give me, give me, give me, because we need to use those and figure out, really take inventory of what the assets are that exist to date, um, and then how can we either make that evolve into the new design that we're working with, or how do we play to the existing brands, because a lot of times we'll have someone that says, we have a logo, we love it, we're not touching it, that's it, great, that's, that's totally fine. And so they just have to understand, like, what are your goals, who you're trying to target, does that play? And a lot of times, uh, specifically, we're working with mom and pa shops. If they have a logo, um, whenever we ask, they usually send us in, like a JPEG or something, and that always ends up it, that always ends up in me basically redesigning their logo, just duplicating it, but in a vector form, so that we can then scale the design because I'll pull elements and colors, and so that's a fun part. Um, so outside, you know, we talk about brand assets, color, typography, iconography, any logo variants, because a lot of times they'll have, you know, this logo for their website header that's on their current site and a slight variation for their business card or something else. Um, 
But ultimately, when designing a website, plan for uh, what's considered a design system. Has anyone heard that term? You're not in your head, you've heard that term? Anyone ever heard of design, to, uh, what a design system is? Can anyone explain that? Yes, um, <clears throat> the overarching, like, basically like a library or a glossary of the different design um, elements that you can use throughout the brand. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much on point right there. So when thinking about design, you want to think as long-term as possible. So think not only how is this going to affect in the next week, month, six months, year, five years, ten years. You want to think as long-term as possible so that you can you know, plan and, and make that a, scal a scalable entity. So creating something that would be considered a design system is just that. It's creating all of the different elements. So when talking about a, a, a website, what are some elements on a website? The colors. Colors? Menus. <laughs> Menus. I should be hearing more. <laughs> Font. <laughs> sliders. <laughs> sliders. <laughs> sliders. <laughs> 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 header. Buttons, Buttons. Header. What? Logo. Logo. Margin and padding with cross elements. Margin and padding. All of those. So everything that you guys are thinking about, whether consciously or subconsciously, as some of you, you know, more experienced than others, might be getting into the motion and you just know, oh yeah, this margin needs to be this, or you know, I need to add more padding or whatever it is. Um, all of those things need to be considered when building this design system. And the real key is, as an individual, it's great because it's just you. As a team, you have to make sure everybody's on board. Because if someone's not on board and they're not pulling from that library that you've created of, this is what all of our buttons need to look like, or here's the variation of buttons, and here's the font families, and here's the colors, and here's what the menu needs to be for mobile and desktop, etc. So. All of those elements need to be concise. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about it later on, but um, when talking about UX or user experience and the psychology of it, uh, there's something called the law of similarity. <clears throat> and that's basically just creating a cohesive design. Uh, things that, you know, when you think of a, a classic element, what I would consider in a website today is kind of the tri column. It's a little snippet of text with an icon, you know, icon text, icon text, icon text. It's for services or your portfolio or whatever people put in there now. Um, if you make this icon gray, this icon gray, and this icon black, you've broken the law of similarity. So it's making that cohesive understanding that when you animate or hover or create some effects, that could change the color. But the law of similarity is just creating that cohesiveness. So. Along the lines, we just talked a little bit about design systems. What are some, so keeping in mind with WordPress, WordPress themes, since we're all at least basically familiar with WordPress themes, what are some themes that you guys use or have used today that might help you create a scalable site? I say that because having experience and built a lot of websites, um, I know that there are some poor things out there because I made those choices. So I saw the theme because I was sold and it looked great in the demo and then I get it and I realize, oh, this either has too much, not enough, poor code, lots of other options, lots of other things. So what are some things that you guys have used or are currently using if you have like a default theme? 2017. 2017, <laughs> WordPress default, there you go. Yes. Ascension. Ascension. SKT Charity. Okay. Yeah, I use Jerry too. And XMAC, XMAC, I use XMAC, mm -hmm. that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. High end. High end. Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. What was that, John? Yeah. Beaver Builder, X Theme, there's, there's lots of big ones out there, yes. I have a question about that too, because I'm, I'm building two sites for two different organizations. I'm using product themes just like Diddy Builder, right? To just kind of build it from scratch, not totally from scratch, but build it from a blank page. Then I'm using this a regular, the cherry that we cherry theme for the other one. Is there like one is better than the other one, or should I be using that Thrive theme? Because I know that's, that's, some people say that's not a good thing to use. It's better to use something from scratch. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I see, I see some 
kind of like yes, no in the crowd. So, uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, um, but essentially, there are, you know, not everything is, is created equal. So, when you think about what a theme is, and some, I mean, someone else coded this skin that you're applying to your website. Um, they basically did some design aesthetics for you that you're just going to take and apply. How well was it coded? How, you know, because why I say too many features, it could be a bad thing because that's unused code that could weigh down the site. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just really diving into it. There are some tools online, I don't remember off the top of my head, where you can check quality of themes. Obviously, you can look at sources, um, you know, in Vado or directly from the WordPress repository just to see which ones might be quality based on ratings and reviews, but that's something to consider. Um, yes, back. You have to have faith, right? I mean, you have, so to generally start. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not enough. You don't really build things from scratch. I mean, you can. So there's lots of, you know. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of blank templates, or there's a couple of skeleton ones that basically just give you a framework that you build up. Uh, obviously, you can take existing themes and branch off of those. Uh, if you're feeling really daring, you can just literally start from scratch. Um, so it just depends on what your level of expertise is, what your level of comfort comfortability, um, how quickly you need to get the site up because. When talking with prospective clients or clients, you have to factor that in. You know, there's time, there's money, and you, I mean, you want to be paid for your work. You don't want to say, "Hey, well, I'm going to, you know, create something from scratch," because I know I can do it and I'm good. But then it takes you, you know, so many months extra time. So those things, you know, definitely have to be considered. Um, so who here is currently doing work for a client? Someone else? Okay, about half. What are some of the questions that you would have asked or ha that you asked or have asked said client when preparing for this project? Most of the audience, you know, they're trying to reach. Okay, audience? Do you have content? Do you have content? Love that question. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, gen the general answer? Like, no. Uh, <laughs> they're like, can you go to my Facebook page? <laughs> Yeah, and then you find out they didn't have one, it was on a personal page, and you're just, it's a whole mess. So content, do you have content? Audience, in the back? How do they want people to come to the site? Just for referrals or search or whatever? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, what is the source? What, what's the target source that we're going after? Is it literally via search engines, or is it via social media? Is it email marketing is another medium? Um, a good question. <laughs> is you know, what is the primary goal of the site? Because when talking with a client, they will often say, or anyone, or if you're building for yourself, you gotta think, what is the overarching goal of this site, and how do I accomplish that with not only the interface that I'm gonna design, but then how do I make that experience not only feel good, but push the client to accomplish said goal? Obviously, there can be secondary, tertiary goals, and there can be goals for individual pages, but as a primary goal, you know, is it, get more calls, get more form signups, is it, you know, push them to convert in X, Y, or Z. So it's really figuring out what are those goals. Any other standard questions? Yes? Good question. <laughs> that's, that's another good question, and I would, I would definitely urge all of you to not shy away from, because I remember experiencing that and thinking, oh, this is kind of an awkward question. Uh, a lot of people feel like, oh, financials, that's a no-no. You have to know this answer. Because when a client comes to you, which has happened, and they say, I want Amazon, and they were gonna pay you 10 grand, and you think, well, that's not, you can't get that. That's not how that works. Or I want Apple, or I want, you know, whatever, they look at this great, beautifully designed, beautifully functioning website, and they say, I want that. Well, that's fantastic, but you're gonna to have to pony up a little bit more money. That's you, you know, it's you can't get something like that for five dollars. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. You could try going to Fiverr, but I wouldn't suggest it. <laughs> um, exploration. So the quote: "Make it simple but significant." I'm definitely a minimalist. 
That is uh, not in, in the aspect of, you know, I have no furniture in my house. I'm not like extreme, but for me, you know, simplicity is, is what I love and I try and incorporate that in a lot of my design. You see that here is I use a lot of spacing. Uh, but in my experience, inspiration usually isn't something that you just divine. It isn't just, oh, this is what I'm gonna do, perfect, and we're good. It's something that you have to find. So that goes back to me walking around aimlessly as I was just kind of soaking in the ambiance of this building. It's, it's, it's definitely a beautiful structure inside and out. Um, I was just at Disneyland this last weekend and the, the last time I was there was, I was six years old and I am turning 29, so just over two decades ago, I don't remember a thing, uh, anything about the park before. And I was going, I have, a wife and two kids, so it was a fun experience. But the funniest part was um, one, a book that I've read is called Be Our Guest. Has anyone ever heard of that book before? Okay, so if you haven't read the book. Yes. Awesome. It will go on for a few more minutes. <laughs> uh, so there's a book called Be Our Guest. Uh, I forgot who the author is, but it. But it it's all about Disneyland and how they built the experience that they give to customers. And not only just customers, but the people that actually work there and just an end-to-end -end experience. It's not about, hey, check out this park or that. It's, it's all of the behind the scenes items. So the whole trip, so I was there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, my wife thought I was crazy because she asked me, it was Saturday after our second day. She's like, what is your favorite ride? I said, well, I really like this ride, but what I really loved was how the pavement from this <laughs> land transitioned into the pavement of that land. Because how they made, built that experience is you're in Adventureland and how they make you feel with the music, the, the smells, the texture, everything about it, how the people are dressed. Um, and then you transition to something like Toontown. And by the way, I will have to say, we're sitting on this train at the Toontown train station, for anyone that's been there, but I'm looking at these crates, and they were, dis and I just, it just dawned on me, I'm like, to be the person to design a crate, so it looks like a crate, but also looks like a cartoony crate, but also is a functional crate. <laughs> so like three different elements to that one box that I was looking at would be somewhat difficult. You think it's just, oh, it's just a cartoony crate, but you had to recognize it as a real crate to recognize it as a cartoon. So there's all those elements. One of my favorite things from the book uh, about the total experience was you never see what they call, the employees are called cast members. You never see the cast members that belong, you know, in their adventure clothing that are supposed to be in adventure land. You never see them in Toontown wearing those clothes because that would break the experience. So they built this whole tunnel system because Disneyland was built on a marsh. So they have this whole tunnel system where any employee can get to anywhere in the park in about a minute and a half. So they just pop up in all these. So I was sitting there looking for these hidden doors and other things. <laughs> I found a bunch, but I'm sure I missed some too. Cause you just, I'm standing there and then all of a sudden there's an employee there. That person was not there before. Where did they come from? So, but Disneyland, you know, they've been there for who knows how long and you know all the other parks hong kong paris uh this one in tokyo there's two in tokyo two in, okay that's crazy <laughs> and it's I guess, not owned by disney either okay it's owned by the government of japan i could see that so they have and, also in 7 -Eleven. <laughs> okay so they have that then they also have obviously disney world so all those parks how do they maintain the look and feel across a global audience while well, having that scalable design and not necessarily, I mean, they have their own version of a design system, but all of the elements from their website to their app down to the way they dress and how they make you feel. I noticed that when I was leaving the park, uh, the music was a saddening feeling as they don't want you to actually leave. And I definitely caught that. And I made note to my father-in-law who was staying there. I said, this is, they definitely want you to go back inside. Um, So having a good list of source material. So I mentioned the book, I mentioned walking around. Where are some places that you either have or could think of that you could garner inspiration from? If it's a brick and mortar business, 
Yes. <coughs> Perfect. So physical location. Products they offer. Products they offer. So actually looking at whether it's the tangible or you know if it's a SaaS, whatever it is. So looking at those products and seeing how are they made, how are they look. You have your nature. Nature. Love that. So I mean, at our place of work, we typically go on at least one walk a day. So just to kind of get our minds out of what we were doing, but also I take the time to just look at every little thing and guard that inspiration. Yes? Grocery stores. Grocery stores? There's a huge variation with like Safeway versus Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, and they give you totally different experiences. Yeah. Basically, you can go to the that, that is an awesome, I, I actually don't know if I've ever thought of grocery stores, not that I wouldn't have been there and looked at things, but having that, you know, from a Walmart to a Trader Joe's to a Kmart, those would be vastly different, I totally agree, yes? Another one that I just thought of was hotels, actually, because I actually remember hearing a speaker at a library conference talk about hotels as inspirations for libraries, and there were a lot of people in the audience like, wait, what, huh? But if you think about it, a lot of these modern hotels are really trying to get, you know, to be communal vibes. You know, they have kind of like mini urban hives in their lobby. Yeah. And it depends on the brand. You know, like you have a different experience at a Ritz Carlton than you do at a loft hotel. Mm -hmm. And they're targeted towards completely different audiences as well. Definitely. So it's sort of like you find your tribe in the hotel that you like the most. Yeah, that's awesome. So obviously paintings, I mean, whether that is you know, any sort of art that's been done, there's lots of artwork here. What, what are the different styles, you know, mediums that, that things were created, architecture. Uh, at my own desk, um, I have a stack of interior design magazines. I am not an interior designer. Like, I, I'm not. But as a designer, I do, I do know what would be, what would work, and, and a lot of, the trends that come into websites do come from interior design. Uh, I mean, one of the latest ones would be Brutalism. Has anyone heard of Brutalism? Basically, all the 90s cruddy websites are coming back. Oh. That's what I say that jokingly because there's some good elements of Brutalism, but it's really stripping out uh, a lot of the unnecessary. It's a lot of vibrant colors. It's, a, it's, a, it's really in your face. Um, but that is a design that was an interior design movement that's making its way into web design. So just things to think about. Um, so I know that we talked about exploring via competitors. How would you go about that? So doing competitor research when talking about, hey, we've we've got to accomplish, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z goals. One of the questions is, who are your competitors to the client or to yourself? How would you go about that research? Google? Yeah, there's a fancy tool called Google. <laughs> and you can find pretty much anything there, but obviously you can be searching for days without proper direction from the source, you know, client or whatever. Yes? Go to your local library. There are some fantastic business databases available to you for free. Yeah. yeah. So you can do, um, you know, Chamber of Commerce online, lots of other sources, but uh, even kind of a back-end way, just depending on what the what you're trying to accomplish within the website, but if you're gonna do something like SEO and keyword research, then you can do keyword competitor research and find competitors that way, and then you know, look at their websites, figure out what they do well, what they don't do well, what you can improve upon. Um, and then, of course, as a designer, using sites such as Dribbble or Behance or the awards, so that three W's, a w w w awards dot com, I think is what it is, where they just basically showcase a lot of. Uh, you can submit your own website there, and you know you might win best website of the day or month. But it's a good way to find showcase piece websites that you might be able to find an element or two that you like and pull that in. So strategy. Obviously, with research comes strategy. This dog. Uh, it is in the resources. It was uh, from a recent article, not this PDF or this guide, but this was part of a larger article recently done by Envision in the past month. 
about a UX strategy and how to implement that. And this guy was created by a couple of UX experts in the industry. And so we've adopted this into our own process and we fill out all these questions. I know it's a little unlegible here, so I'll read a few things. So the first thing is, what's the problem? Like, what are you trying to solve? Uh, what are some of the outcomes that you could do? What are some of the challenges? This is the box over on the right. What are some of the challenges that you might, that have, been come, have come across? Uh, what are some of the differentiators between your website you're gonna work on versus a competitor website? Um, how are you gonna measure that? Because if you're not measuring, then my question is, what are you doing? Because you won't be able to tell if it's a success. So yes. Sorry, how are you measuring that? So just measuring the effectiveness of the goals that you set. How are you going to do that? So when you build this site, like you just built this, what you consider to be the best website ever. If you're not creating measurement, and we're going to talk about setting up the analytics and how that pertains to UX. Um, but if you're not setting that up or not tracking anything, then there's no real way to tell if it's if it was truly an effective design or not. Um, so obviously the yellow column is solution ideas. So this is where you could propose these are the elements and this is how we're gonna improve upon that. Uh, this green box, these two down here, uh, users and customers and user benefits. So this is more like your buyer persona, a brief outline here of who you're gonna target and then how do they benefit? Because ultimately, if a person's not benefiting from the site, they are not going to be on said site. They are going to leave. Um, and then the three red are hypothesis, uh, the riskiest assumptions, and risk management experiments. So what you hypothesize is gonna happen. What are some of the assumptions, the risks that you're gonna take on with, you know, if you're gonna do an overhaul, as you had mentioned earlier, an overhaul of the whole logo, the whole brand, the website, everything, well, a risk that you could assume off of that is a loss of brand equity. People might not recognize you and you might drop off with some users, but that might be your goal to target new users. So uh, this guide helps in research of you know problems, uh, audiences, ideas. Just it, it's a good source, especially if you create this as part of your base so that you know moving forward you can constantly refer back to and know Oh, this is the problem because how many of you, and I'll say this, I know from personal, how many of you by show of hands have ever designed slash built any WordPress website and in the process you're changing things because you think, oh, this will be cool or this would be better this way. I, I've done that so many times and you just have to rein yourself in and realize, you know, this would be cool but it would also take me another month or a few more weeks or even a few more hours and is that crucial to the goals? Uh, I tweeted out the link to that article on that guide through the Sacramento WordPress oh, cool. Twitter handle, so you can find it there. Yeah, and it's also in the resources, so I can send that out as well. Um, yes? I can't really tell, but is, it, um, is there a, a sample of what you think somebody might put? In yes, the underneath underneath each one of these, and a, in the tweet that you can okay. reference or my slides after, there's some text underneath that gives an example of what each one would be. So it's a really good starter kit. Um, so outside of this strategy guide, there's two other key elements that we like to do, and that is sitemap and wireframes. Anybody not know or have never heard of that? I'm not sure what wireframes. Okay, good question. Wireframes would be like if you strip the walls of you know whatever the brick, and you just see the framework of the building. <coughs> so wireframe is the literal frame of the building, and then when you actually so you get the general structure of that house and you say, okay, this is where the chimney goes, this is where the front door goes, but if you're still just doing a framework, you haven't put in the electrical, you haven't done any of the plumbing, you haven't, you know, spackled or whatever it ends up being. So it's literally just the framework of the website as a suggested, I would say a little bit heavier than just a suggested structure, but what the site will overall look like in layout and form. Does that make sense? It's like a line drawing. It's, it's, a blueprint. it's, it's not too different in some ways than like this menu. document. It's like here's where the menu goes, here's where the heading goes. It's like yeah. imagine if you drew on a piece of paper what your website would look like with no design. That's right. No colors, no pictures, no text. You might just go, here's the square, 
here's the menu, here's where I'm going to put a, an image, I'm going to do a squiggly line for text. A blueprint. A blueprint. But so a wireframe kind of describes a specific page, yeah, because definitely. Yeah, and that's why you want to do it in hand with your overall strategy, so that you're you're laying out these blueprints for each page ahead of time, so that when you get to the design, you're not actually just you're not doing it all at once and trying to kind of hodgepodge something together. It's clearly okay. Here's the goal of this page. So I want people to, you know, here's the hero image and the first thing, the goal, I want them to sign up for my email list. So I'm going to put a little email sign up, you know, placeholder there, etc. So, and that could change from page to page. So you're right. So this is something where if you're going to use a predefined theme, you set all this, you figure this stuff ahead of time. Now you start looking at the themes and say, which one is going to get me closest to what I'm looking for? It's definitely a perspective that you can take for sure. So... You can do that. Uh, know that a lot of the major things that we mentioned here are very flexible. So it's not that if you laid out your blueprint this way and you don't find a theme that doesn't look you know, even close to that, that you can't reach that with one of the major themes. So, um, and then obviously a sitemap would be the overall hierarchy. So how many pages, what are they, how are they, you know, stacked, are we doing home about, blog contact and then in the about page is there like a testimonial sub page and a history sub page or whatever that ends up being so really playing out ahead of time you know these are the pages we're going to make and then you can kind of decipher which ones are going to be harder to create when you think about an e-commerce site you know those from just a static site that doesn't sell any products to one that does you have to factor in you know product check out all of that indexing so there's lots of additional pages there so creating that hierarchy of i mean i use a tool called mind map so it's just flow chart type stuff uh where you just map out the whole process of here's all the pages and here's this one will link to this and that it shows that uh content phase so i like this one simplicity wit and good typography um our content writer at our place of work, uh, I, I can honestly say I, I did not like puns. I, I'm not, that's, it doesn't make me laugh typically, but then when I started working where I work now and my coworker, she gives me a laugh at all of the puns. I don't know, she's just way wittier about how she does, because I've been listening to my dad, or you know, the whole dad pun thing. So, um, but having that good wit about it, and, and that comes out through the voice and tone, the message that you're trying to create within the copy or the text that you're actually writing for the website. So at this stage of the content, we've talked about the research. So you've done all the strategy, you've, you've considered wireframes, you have a site map, so you know what pages are gonna be made. Um, so this, you're really starting to fill out that wireframe, so you know, okay, <coughs> here's my homepage. These are the goals of the page, so I need to write to this, and here's their target. So I need to speak to a 15 to 30 year old woman or a 40 to 65 year old man or whatever it is. Um, so because you know people talk differently, so you need to be able to target that. Um, but this is really where your website begins to take on life. So you start to really see these elements. So don't get distraught before by having you know only this blueprint and it's you're thinking man this looks ugly I'm never going to be able to finish this because I can't find a theme to match or something because you start writing this this copy um, and I, you and you start telling a story and this is where you actually have to start considering things like the type families the fonts you have to start factoring in color uh, because from this color to that color to that color I mean you could make all of these the exact same and only the exact same size and font look and just change the color and that will change how it's visually perceived. So um, font weight, are you gonna do caps, all caps, no caps? I mean, you don't just have to do when it comes to design, you don't just have to do, you know, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase. You don't have to always do 
a period, uh, you know, punctuation is something to consider. Yes? Are there any themes that have, that give you the ability to use any font? Um, there are a lot of themes that incorporate open source libraries like Google Fonts, uh, type kits for Adobe, those are two big foundries uh, where you can source a lot of fonts from that and also a lot of themes have those built in which are really good. Uh, there are obviously a lot of plugins where you can either purchase or source from. There's sites like Dove Font where you can source free fonts from that are a little bit more uh, custom or stylized and and then use some sort of plugin to you know add that into your site uh, keeping in mind that when it comes to fonts specifically typekit and google fonts are i mean in my mind the two primaries in the sense that they tell you when you're going to select the fonts this is the load time it's going to be on your website and they suggest oh maybe you shouldn't have you know seven different fonts just use one or two and then change the weights and that will give you the visual difference in part of the user interface like I was just saying these are all the same font family uh, but it's you know capital lowercase all capital and this is just a smaller font size so one font three different styles it's it's a lot easier that way um, so yeah depending on on also depending on your choice of things, some might incorporate a way to, uh, when designing, you can think of headers, you know, H1, H2, H3, body, you know, paragraph, copy, all of that. Um, some things incorporate your selection of choice as, you know, I can say H1, I want it to be this font family and this weight and this padding, etc., and then H2 through 4, etc. So it can help you to uh, expand that design system where you create that scalability because that theme offers that feature. So the buyer's journey, um, can anyone tell me what the buyer's journey is? Has anyone ever heard that term, the buyer's journey? Yes. Kind of the way they funnel through from page to page or to yeah. directions. Yes. If you get to a point of conversion. Yeah. A funnel to a conversion. Influences and considerations in their decision to engage in behavior. Yeah. So as HubSpot coined the buyer's journey term, there's three stages. So it's awareness, consideration, and decision. So as you think about designing your web pages and how you're going to create these funnels for each page, you have to factor in okay, is the person that's, is the user of this page at this moment in the awareness stage, the consideration, or the decision? And there's different things that you can do. So example, buyers in the awareness stage will visit your blog, uh, interact with your social content. Those are people that are just kind of getting the feel, becoming aware of who you are, what you offer. Uh, buyers in the consideration stage will visit your product pages, uh, benefits or features pages about us, uh, maybe your area of expertise. So they found you, they maybe became aware, they you know, found you on social or whatever, and now they're looking into you as a company or entity or person. They're trying to, okay, what, how, you know, who is this person? Who is this group? Uh, what do they offer? Let's see their pricing. Um, well, so then the buyers in the decision stage will actually visit the pricing page, case studies, and ultimately the contact page because they have gone through, okay, I'm aware, I now considered what they offer, and now I'm willing to communicate with this company through the website, and thus decide, you know, do I want it? And that's when you, you know, the salesperson or you, yes? You were speaking about conversion. Uh, yeah. Was that, is that like an added part of your uh, credit card information? So, great question. Lots, there's lots of different types of conversions. So one conversion would be someone comes from Facebook to your website and you want them to sign up for your email and they sign up. That's a conversion. You could do someone comes to your website and they go to the products page and click the product, add to cart, buy it, conversion. So they've done the full, it's, they've, I was about to say they've done the full process, but really there is no end. Once someone has purchased, 
or made contact or signed up or whatever that, that data point is that you've considered a conversion, uh, there's still more to be done. How do you continue to delight them? How do you continue to make them want to engage with more of your content? Do you tell them, hey, thanks for purchasing. Why not check out our blog? Here's a good thing based off your purchase. This is an article that we would suggest. So there's lots of ways to keep them involved, but those would be, a, a, you know, watching a video could be a conversion. It's all on how you set that up. Did I answer your question? I mean, I understand what conversion is, but like, I just don't understand the definition of it. So, ulti yeah, ultimately it's... Whatever they call the action. So exactly. Enroll, buy, register, sign up, purchase, whatever it is. It's just the action somebody takes. All right, thanks. Perfect. So, um, so as we just talked about the buyer's journey, writing copy that plays to each of these stages. So if they're on the about page, writing to that, okay, you're not going to say, hey, I see you're in the awareness stage. Thanks for checking me out. You're not going to call that out, but you're going to say things that pertain to people that are just trying to become aware of who you are, people that are trying to consider you or your products. Um, that's where you might show if you're actually selling something, it might be you know, X product versus X product or what Amazon does is the feature, you know, you may also like. So, um, and then on top of all of that, and we kind of talked about it briefly, but there's something called micro copy. Anyone ever heard of that term? So micro copy is in essence the, the, the supportive text that is used to help you move down the conversion funnel. So an example would be uh, if you see the sign up field, like sign up for my email list, and underneath it says like, we promise not to send you spam. That little piece of text is just letting you know that would be considered micro copy. It doesn't have to be small, but it's just something that helps to emphasize to help you convert or do that call to action, to do that sign up. So that could be you know, whether it's adding a product and they say a little something that helps you, or if you're filling out a form, those, you skip a field and it says error. That's not the best experience when you are filling out a form and it's just like error, you know, you're, you're dumb, you didn't, you skipped that, or you misspelled your name. It's like, that's, it doesn't make you feel good. I know that you don't think about that consciously because we've been on websites, you know, for a long time now, but how to create a better version of that. You know, there's lots of good examples. MailChimp does a really good example of their microcopy when inputting information, whether you're signing up um, or the best one, and they actually made news for it when they launched it, was when you send a campaign from MailChimp, you know, an email marketing platform, at the very end, they have a, a, a monkey's hand that says, that, that gives you a high five just on the computer. That's, what is the point of that? It is nothing to do, you've already accomplished everything that you needed to do. It's just saying, hey, great job. So it's an addition to that helps support. And ultimately I would argue microcopy should always make you feel good. I definitely dislike the microcopy pop-ups that will say, sign up if you want 10% off. And then you have to click the no button that says, no, I don't want to save money. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like getting lots. Yeah, it's, it's like, like they're guilting you. It's so it's guilt copy. That's another term for it. Um, so those are some examples. Yes. Um, it reminds me of the book Evil by Design. Yes. Yes. So uh, I'm sure you've seen those a lot, and they come in lots of forms. Uh, definitely avoid that. You don't want to um, in users with users today. The more you frustrate them the more likely they are to leave. So that could be in the microcopy, that could be in speed of your website, lots of different things. So searchability, just real quick. Searchability or SEO, how does that pertain to UI UX? Uh, make your pages, your content available to the search engine. So yes, yeah, so when you're applying search engine optimization to your website, so that's writing correct copy using keywords. For example, if we're selling um, tickets to an event, you know, or tickets to, to WordCamp, I'm not gonna write a whole bunch of copy about my dog on that page, because that makes no sense, unless my dog's gonna be speaking at WordCamp. Which would be Which awesome. would be awesome, but I don't think that's the case. So, 
really pertaining to, I love this. Does anyone know how what SEO was at the beginning? How SEO worked? You yeah. would literally just Meta put. Tags. You would literally white space, and this was filled with hundreds of white yes. words. And it's like, okay, don't do that. First of all, I'm not giving you that idea. Yeah. That will actually make you go down in rankings. But I love the origin of that. So, but today's day, you actually, you know, organically or naturally put keywords that you want to be found for within the copy of your site. But why that pertains to UI, UX, or user interface and user experience is you want that same copy to help continue to push the user, the reader, through your funnel, down the page, or to click this button to go to the next thing. So you never want to deter them by any confusing words or anything like that. Don't just, you know, don't overuse a lot of the keywords. You know, it's, it always has to be natural. Okay. Yes. So as far as keywords are concerned, the only way that when you're using like WordPress to uh, have keywords like for people to search is in your copy. There's no other place. Yeah. To do. There are a few others. Um, <coughs> So obviously when you think of a website, you think, okay, is this an H1 a header? That's a key thing for SEO. H2s, H2s, et cetera, the body copy. The imagery though, you put a picture, Google doesn't read pictures like we see them with our, with our own eyes. Google just would look at this and see, okay, there's a frame there, but they don't know what's there. So putting the copy to help explain alt what that text. image is, alt text, or and including metadata to any images will help improve SEO too. And there's lots of other ways, but those are just a few of surface things that you can accomplish very easily within the WordPress platform. I mean, I love adding, you know, any images that can be added, there's really key places that have been built just for that reason. Um, so the design phase, obviously the culmination of research and content at this point, you should not I mean, all, there's a lot of legwork and ground foundation that has been laid, and so you need to take that and run with it and really start to apply a more visual element. So, uh, you know, if you're an individual, this is, you know, you did the research, you wrote the copy, you did the strategy, et cetera, so now you're applying that. So you might have a little mesh of these phases, but in my experience working with a team, with our content writers, I go back to them within this phase, so design and content are a lot of times hand in hand because content will write something but they don't know what the visual aspect's gonna be like. So I might say I need a, you know, a few more sentences or another paragraph or can we condense this and maintain keywords and maintain the strategy. So you, you tend to work hand in hand, but this is where you start to think about, okay, what are some trends? What are some design? How do I make the website relevant? How do I make it modern? How do I how how do I make it forward thinking as much as possible? How do I push the limits without, you know, going crazy and, and confusing people on the site because you did too many elaborate things? So you can look at resources like Material Design, which is design methodology coined by Google. You can look at um, Fluent Design, which is by Microsoft. You can look at you know Brutalist, Flat Design, or Flat 2.0. There's lots of design trends that if you were to just Google any of those, you'd be like, okay, I've seen that before. Anyone here use any Google products? Google G Suite, you know Gmail, Google, the new Google Calendar. That's all Material Design. Um, they have some great guidelines on how to build to Material Design, and they all do. Do you typically start with one of those as kind of like a basic framework, or do you build no. your own now that you have so much experience? And just um, you can see? I it's always to the client. So it's what what are the goals they're trying to accomplish? Who are their target audience? Because I'm not going to do something that is, you know, I'm not going to do brutalist this new design trend uh, for uh, a target audience that might be seven year old, you know like businessmen that they you know, maybe don't understand this new concept. So, um, so it really just depends on the client, but I do always try and stay on top of all the trends so that I know, okay, this is what's relevant today. Uh, but keeping in mind, you know, retros, there's still a lot of great designs that you can do, callbacks that would be effective, yes. Yeah, people get frustrated with uh, like, you know, pre-designed themes that seem to kind of dictate 
Because I'm not sure yes. what the difference the theme I have now. I and that, like, well, I'm letting this theme kind of drive the, the content choices. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, I would get frustrated at that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you just have to be a little bit more uh, picky about the theme choices, mm -hmm. knowing that there's a huge repository out there, multiple you know databases full of themes, and obviously we've got a whole crowd of people that are in the same boat, so picking the brains of other people within this community, really great choice to say, hey, these are... You know, here's some good things. We heard some great ones here today. Um, so yeah, it's it's really factoring. In, okay, what's the goal, and does the theme help with that, or does it deter? And in, in that case, like what you just proposed, yeah, it's driving a lot of the design or content choices, and that ultimately is not good. Did I see another hand? Okay. Yes, sorry. No, uh, kind of like going back to what you were uh, talking about as far as inspiration goes. Yeah. Um, like. You say like maybe like in a game of like inspiration from actual people too, like like you know, there's trends in, in pop culture definitely and cultures and, and Yep. Yeah, no no that's that's perfect. I mean there isn't a source I wouldn't consider. So it's just a lot of people when designing websites or building websites, they just look at other websites and you just gotta think there's a bigger world out there and a lot of what comes to web design comes from other sources outside of this industry, meaning nature or interior design or fashion or industrial, whatever that is. And so being able to find those elements and, and incorporate that, yes. Well, and another way of thinking about it would be imagine if you were building a website for something that you wouldn't expect to necessarily have or need a website. Like what if you had to build a website for a national park? It's going to have a completely different aesthetic than a website that you would have for the ritzy jewelry store that just opened up down the street. Exactly. So, piggybacking off of that, these are some of the things um, that we designed. It's kind of hard to tell with the blurriness, but uh, each one is a different industry. We have a hunter, a lawyer, a financial and tax advisor. Uh, they, this company builds cars. This is a construction company. This is real estate. And how do we? One of our goals and one of my personal goals is every single thing I design, I want it to uh, obviously be fantastic, but I want it to stand alone alone apart from anything else I've designed. So I always try and push the limits as much as I can and um, and at the same time still accomplish all the goals and the strategy, etc. So obviously after you design, there's you, you don't just design and forget. You have to really put it in the wild, test it. And I don't mean just build it and throw it to a live site, but I mean when you're picking a button if you're to Google what's the most highly converted color of a button, it's going to tell you red or green. That's, I mean, because of how color works and what the emotions it evokes. But if, if red and green are not in your color palette, then that could break the brand or the visual identity of what you're trying to accomplish. So it's not that there's just one color or one method. So that's why taking this element you've designed, this button or this menu, and putting it you know, into this mock-up that you're creating of your whole site, uh, to re then you will start to see these elements come together and really say, oh, that's not going to work, or and change it from there. Uh, so I just want to quickly say, uh, design thinking is it's kind of a coined term. I mean, it's not kind of, it is a coined term, uh, but really it's just, it's not just building a site, it's thinking about the interface, it's thinking about the experience, and how do we push people through uh, and there's lots of things that come into that. We talked about the law of similarity. There's uh, what's considered the law of proximity, which is another psychology. It's law of proximity is, it really has to do with all the spacing that you create and, and how those associate with one another. Uh, color theory, again, we talked about what does is, what is red evoke? What, what emotions do you get? What does blue create? What does purple create? What does orange create? Again, I was talking about that with a client today and we were trying to figure out this color palette together. Um, this is where you will start to think of, you know, creating a set of icons that might help support your brand. Consider animations. So how does, when you hover over a button, what does that animation do? And it should never do anything. It should never take very long. It should, I mean, it should be a, a very quick animation. And it should only support what the user is actually trying to do. Don't throw animations on just for the fun of it. Because that's a deterrent. 
Um, so last, uh, the last two as I'm closing out this, uh, build phase. So obviously you've researched, done the content, done the design. Now you actually get to the building of it. Uh, this is where you've talked about, or we've thought about themes. We've talked a little bit about plugins where you really have to be picky and decide, does this pertain, does this plugin give me the features I'm looking for? Um, a lot of times like Jetpack, there's plugins that do multiple things. I remember we worked on a website that the client had, it was like 30 to 40 plugins and I was, my mind was blown. I was just looking at it and I was like, you, th you no wonder your site is so slow because you have all these additional things that are not being used. Um, so just thinking about those things when building and then hosting, super important. Not all hosting plans are created equal. Can't tell you how much I hate when people say, hey, pick that GoDaddy $1 plan that they do all the time. Like a, It's 12 bucks a year. when they, it's, it's like every six months it comes out again. And, I'm just, and they're like, oh, but it's really cheap. And I said, yeah, and your website will load slower and it will have a lot of downtime. And there's other things that you have to consider. So speed, because faster speed is higher conversions. Um, one of my favorite statistics that I, I, I learned a few years back was, uh, does anybody know what the average attention span of a person, the, the average individual is today? It's two seconds. Seven. Oh, seven. Seven. I thought it was seven. It's, okay, it's eight seconds. The average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that is ridiculous. That means if you were to tap on a fish tank that's goldfish, you would forget what you're doing before the goldfish forgot. <laughs> like, when you think about that, and that was a psychological study done on both fish and people, obviously, to, to it's because we're so inundated with all of the marketing and things that happen today, so how do you design something that truly stands out and you not only gets that attention, but maintains that attention and pulls you through said website. So if someone, who here likes to wait for websites to load? Awesome. So we got one, two, uh, yeah, no one. No one likes to wait. We're, we're a fickle being. We, we, if it, and usually if it's over three seconds, you're gone. Especially uh, something's wrong with Yeah, you think something's wrong or your internet connection, blah, blah, blah. The average website, according to Google, should load in less than a second. I know that's a lot of times pretty hard, but it's totally possible. Um, E-commerce e sites, they suggest loading in under two. So, the loading factor has to do with the hosting, right? Hosting, theme quality, because that's code, plugin quality, because that's code. Any additional code uh, is essentially just more that the browsers have to load. So, you know, factoring that in will, will definitely slow it down. So, picking things that have better code quality or plugins that do, or going from 30 plugins to 10 will vastly improve that. I mean, also the content, pictures, making sure they're compressed. Yes. Um, well, I can say that the one that we use that I that I am firmly happy with is WP Engine. So WordPress Engine, WP as WordPress WP Engine, because they're a dedicated WordPress and they're a global company and they're they're very good. Uh, that's one that we typically use. Uh, also, uh, if you look at so WP Engine, SiteGround, yes, Flywheel, Flywheel. That's um, good. Also, if you're doing e-commerce, Liquid Web rolled out, hosted e-commerce with WooCommerce, that's really, really fast and has incredible analytics built in. So depending on what you're doing, um, you it, have a little fast. It's you really, know, like some of these online. Yeah. yeah. It's really looking at the host. Uh, there's lots of hosting companies that are considered jack of all trades, master of none, because that's the full quote. I mean, GoDay is a great platform, but they do a lot. So, and they do have some very high end dedicated hosting plans, but obviously it's a pretty penny. To get to that level where WP Engine is about 29, I think the lowest plan is $29, and they include things like SSL and other options it's built in. It's the, most, yeah. it's the most value for your cost yes. of all the managed WordPress hosts. So it's the lowest, kind of a low tier with a high value. If you compare all the different managed WordPress hosts, WP Engine provides the best value. Yes. Yeah, so um, 
to close this out, the last phase we're going to do is the launch phase. So launch does not mean done. So don't think of it that way because there is no such thing as a perfect website. Because users are going to dictate how that works and they will break it. Not saying that they're going to take it down. You're not going to get attacked by hackers most likely. But uh, they will find this weird quirk or something or on their browser, on their device at that time it didn't work and they're going to complain about it. So making sure that you have set up when launching your site all of the proper analytics, whether that's Google Analytics or heat mapping like Hotjar or Crazy A or whatever other tools out there that you want to use to properly track not only setting up goals and conversions, you can see, okay, someone signed up, boom, there's a goal, there's a conversion goal. Um, but being able to track, you know, we launched this uh, event site that we're currently monitoring using heat map and site recording so we can see what people are doing and then we can make decisions for the website based off of that data. So that's where A-B testing comes into play. And just so you know, A-B testing is, you have your site here and the button is red and you create an identical version in the site here and the button is green. And you serve that up to different, ent to different audiences and then you figure out which one does better and then you take that one and then you split it again, you constantly iterate. So launching is taking that data and continually improving because, like I said, there's no such thing as a perfect site. Um, and lastly, as I said, I have a lot of the list of resources with direct links, including that the tweet that you sent out. But if anyone wants to talk to me after, ask me any questions, um, I do have my cards. So you can email me, and I can email you the slides. Thank you. Awesome.